I was hoping that if I just kept sitting, we'd keep singing. But I selected the number of verses, so I guess it's on me. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I love our worship. I don't, how, however I'm feeling when I come in, God just changes my heart. God just changes things. I mean, we come in here, and, and I can see it in a lot of you, too. You come in stressed out by the world and carrying burdens, and, 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 and we, we start to receive forgiveness of sins. We acknowledge God's presence in our worship, in, in our lives. We sing the opening hymn. We hear the word of God. We sing another hymn, and, and, and we're anticipating the climax when when we receive the very body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion. Oh, it's a magical thing, you know? It really is. Worship is a magical thing. And, and when we sing, this is the feast, these words always just take me into another realm. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Have you ever really thought about what those words mean? It's not just words that we sing, but we're part of something far bigger than the congregation of peace in Christ, far bigger than the community of Walkersville, the state of Maryland, or even this world. We're singing with, joining in the hymn of all creation with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We laud in and magnify God's glory. Wow. I didn't mean to say any of that. I just got kind of overwhelmed with it. But what I want to talk to you today about is in our gospel reading is do we believe that God is omnipotent? Um, omnipotent? Omnipotent is what it sounds like, is what it looks like. Omnipotent. Do we believe that God has all power? Do you believe that God has all power? Everybody? Everybody believes that God is all powerful? Do you believe that that power can be manifested and transformed in individual lives? Of course, if God is all powerful and we are not, and we reach out to God in our times of trouble, God has the power to change us. Any of you been changed by the power of God? That's good. We should all be changed by the power of God. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for the last 27 years, and one of the things that we talk about in the book and of, of how people, when they're, they're coming and they're trying to get clean and they're trying to get sober, one of the lines of the big book is lack of power. That was our dilemma. And apart from God, that is our dilemma, isn't it? Because we might wish to be different, we might hope to be different, but in and of ourselves, we just don't have the power. You've heard the expression of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, haven't you? That means like if I'm standing on this one foot and I grab my shoelaces, how am I gonna lift myself up with all my weight on it? It's just not possible. We can't do those things, but God can do those things for us, amen? And if God wants to change us, what does God want to change us from? And what does God want to change us into? He wants to change us from selfishness and self-centeredness. I mean, we have this from birth. A child that's born, for those of you that have had them, and for those of you that have been around them, you know that this is true. They cry when they want something. They're Diaper needs change, they're hungry, they're scared. Who knows what it is? They can't really communicate to us except by crying. And if you've ever doubted the doctrine of original sin, the sin that we inherit from our parents and the parents before all the way back to Adam, just put a couple two-year-olds in a room with one toy and give them five minutes. Do you think they have worked out an equitable way of sharing the toy for... You get it for two and a half minutes, and I'll take it for two and a half minutes. 
No, you'll walk into that room and one will be happy because they're victorious and one will be screaming and angry in defeat. We have that selfishness, that, that inward turn to ourselves. And what God is interested in is changing that, changing that inward turn into, from ourselves because it's not good for us just to be into ourselves because we lack the power. God has the power. Community. The community of God is the strongest power there is because we're together and we're connected with God. And in our parable for today, well, let me set it up. This is, we, we made a big jump. We jumped to a scripture reading that happens after Palm Sunday. So let's go back and review how we got to where we are when this gospel reading began. We started with, with, with Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And he got to Jerusalem. And all the people were singing Hosanna to the son of David and putting branches and clothing on his path. And he rode in on a donkey as a king coming in peace. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Behold, your king comes to you humble and riding on the foal of a donkey. Jesus didn't come to conquer. He came to bring peace. Well, he actually would have to conquer, but not in the way that we're familiar with conquering. He didn't do it with force. He didn't do it with might. He is doing it and continues to do it today through the power of love. So he gets to the temple and he sees the area, the court of the Gentiles, where the people are, who are not Jewish are supposed to be able to come to learn about the God of Israel, the God of hope. And he sees that place filled with animals to be sold for sacrifice and tables where they'd exchange money because the currency of the Roman times had... The emperor had Caesar's picture on it, and it would be a graven image. You couldn't bring that into the temple. You'd have to exchange that for a gold coin that didn't bear that graven image on it to give it to the temple for your tax. So Jesus saw that, and he was angry. He was angry because they had missed the point. They were supposed to be given faith so that they could share it with the Gentiles. They were the glory of God's people and a light unto the Gentiles. But they weren't giving the Gentiles a chance. They weren't bearing fruit. So God overturned the table. Jesus overturned the tables. He drove out the animals. And all that was left there was... Jesus and Jesus alone, whose sacrifice would be the last sacrifice that we would ever have to consider. God gave the ultimate one, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Standing there in the center of this temple that used to be the focal point where people would come to worship and praise God was Jesus, who around his person would then become the focal point of all worship and praise. Pretty big changes, right? Pretty big changes that are going down. And the religious leaders didn't recognize that Jesus was in fact the son of God. They didn't realize that all the scriptures pointed to him. And they rebelled against it because they were causing change. And they didn't like it. So Jesus left. He went home. Stayed in Bethany. And on his way back to the temple the next day, he was hungry. And he saw a fig tree. It had leaves on it. And he went to the tree to get some fruit, but it was bearing no fruit. So he cursed it. He caused it to wither. The disciples were amazed at how quickly the tree had withered. The fig tree is a picture and a symbol of the church, of the temple, of Israel. It was not bearing fruit, so God is withdrawing from it his life-sustaining and life-giving presence. And then he goes to Jerusalem. And the Pharisees and the elders had all night, probably none of them slept, 
to talk about this rabble rouser Jesus and how are we going to deal with him? And so they were hot. And they said to him, by whose authority are you doing these things? You notice they didn't ask anything about what he did, but upon whose authority did you do these things? It's always interesting to me when people object to some really good ideas that might come up, but they're thinking, is this Methodist? Is this Baptist? Is this Lutheran? Where did this come from? What authority? Well, let's talk about God being present in it before we talk about any of those other things. So Jesus plays a typical idiomatic kind of a, a dialogue thing with a rabbinical dialogue thing. He says to the, he says to the Pharisees, I'll tell you what, I'll answer your question. If you answer one for me, John's baptism. He didn't say John, he said the baptism of John because he's not talking about a person, he's talking about an action. He's talking about an action that God is involved in. He's talking about joining in the hymn of all creation. Baptism. Who was it? Was it from man or was it from God? So the Pharisees, they all huddle up. They get together and go, oh. And this is, this is really poignant, too, because it points out where did they get their authority from? Did they consider the word of God in looking at it? They just got together with themselves, and they wondered how were people going to react to this? They had no authority from God. They just had authority from within. You know, there's two sources of authority, amen? Authority from man. The authority of a man is who has the biggest guns, who has the most nuclear weapons, who has the most power, who has the most strength that we can force and inflict our will upon you. And then there's the power of God, the ultimate power of God that doesn't change things so quickly, but always does it through love. You know how difficult it is to have a vision and then to live that vision out among the people. So the Pharisees, they're together, they're huddled. Well, wait a minute. If we say this is from God, they're going to say, well, why didn't you believe it? And if I say it's from man, I'm afraid of the people because they think John is a prophet. So we're just going to play it safe. <laughs> we're going to play it safe. We don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I answer yours. And then he comes up with the most interesting parable. What do you think? A man had two sons. To one he said, go out in my field and work. And the son said, no, sir, I won't. But later had a change of mind and went. To the second one he said, sir, I go. But he never did. Which of the two sons did the will of the father? The Pharisees said, I suppose the first son did the will of the father. Now, why? Why? He said he wouldn't do it, disrespected his father, maybe even in public. That's a huge thing in the Middle Eastern cultures to disrespect. Well, it's a big thing here, too. To disrespect your father, to disrespect your mother, to disrespect authority, that's a big problem. But yet he had a change of heart. Now, there's been a lot of talk about this change of mind versus change of heart. A change of mind in Greek is metanoio, uh, which means to, to change your mind. The word here is uh, meta, metamolini, which means to change your heart. In other words, to grab a hold of something that becomes more important to you than what you once held important. Are you following me here? One thing was important is doing what I wanted to do. Now all of a sudden this becomes more important. For, for, there's another uh, use of this word. When uh, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Now obey doesn't mean rote obedience. Because you know you can obey someone and hate them. You might be forced into obedience. That's not what Jesus is looking for. That's not what God is looking for. The word really means, if you love me, you will hold my teachings dear. You will value the things that I value, and you will willingly want to be a part 
of those things. So they said this first son, the one who said he wouldn't go but actually did. So what is the point of this parable? The point of this parable is that actions speak louder than words. We can sit in here and say all the creeds and say all the right things, but if we do nothing, we're like that second son who said, I go. We're like those Pharisees who said, I'll serve you, Lord, but then they didn't do anything. They rejected the very Lamb of God. This isn't the only place in Scripture that this kind of idea comes up with. Because when Jesus is seeking people to follow him, and Jesus is seeking uh, disciples to join in the growing of the kingdom of God, his invitation is open and inclusive to all people. But not all people will receive it. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells the parable about the king that has a banquet. Now, a banquet is is a metaphor for joining the kingdom of God. And he's looking for those people, an invitation to join the work of the kingdom. And he invites these three people. One of them says, I just bought an oxen and I've got to check it out and make sure it works okay. Please excuse me. Another one says, I just got married and I got to go home to my wife. Please excuse me. A third one said, I just bought some property and I have to go look it over and make sure that it is what I thought it was. Please excuse me. Jesus said none of those people were worthy. And he invited other people off the streets to come instead. So we learn through these parables that, number one, actions speak louder than words. Number two, Jesus is not interested in excuses. He's calling us. He expects us to respond. And in Matthew 25, this is a parable of the talents. A rich man went away for a very long time. And he called his servants together and gave them according to their ability, one five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. And he was gone for a very long time. And when he came back, he called them together to receive what he had given them to use for him. The one that had been given five talents invested it and grew back five more. The one that had been given two talents had invested it and brought back two additional ones. But the one that was given one dug a hole and buried his talent. And the master called him out, and he goes, you could have at least put it on the bank so it got interest. He said, oh, but sir, I was afraid of you. And so I just hid it. Did that get rewarded? You know how the parable ends? He took that one talent and gave it to the one that had ten, that they might use it. So what is our lesson here? Our lesson is that God wants us to be bold in using his resources. God doesn't want us to be afraid. He doesn't want fear to cause inaction in us. So what we have in these three parables so far then is one, actions speak louder than words. Two, God doesn't want any excuses. And three, don't be afraid to act. Martin Luther said, sin boldly. Try something. Get out there and do it. And trust God, the creator of everything, to bless it. There's an old parable about a man that goes up to heaven and he's looking at how beautiful it is. And he he comes into this one room and he sees on this room there's shelves upon shelves that stretch beyond what he can see with ears on them. And he asked God, what's going on here? And he goes, well, these are the ones who heard the word of God but didn't act. And the only thing that got into heaven were their ears. (laughs) Now, we're Lutheran. We're not saved by works. We're saved by God's grace through faith. But, but, what is our response to that? We love Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For we are saved by grace through faith, 
This is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. But we're a little bit mute sometimes on verse 10, which says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to do good works that God himself has prepared in advance for us to do. People of God, you're called, just like I'm called. You're called, you're empowered. God has given you the same power that anybody else has. One of the great things that came out of the Reformation was Martin Luther's concept of the universal priesthood of believers, his table of vocations. Luther said that the priests and bishops and popes are no more spiritual than the person who works in the field. He said, that the hands that change the dirty diaper of a child are every bit as much holy as the hands that distribute the Eucharist. We all have our own vocation. God empowers each and every one of us so that we can have more than words, so that we don't need to make excuses and we can act boldly and without fear. So what do you think? A man had two sons. Who do you want to be? And may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.